Hi, this is Misty Ravi Clut reporting live from Otakon 2018. We're at the Even panel Kudo fails. Samurai, presented by Studio Americano and Miss Holly this is the story and Yori San. Okay. How do you flip the camera? Okay. So, what we're going to start with today, we're going to talk about Yasuke. Has anybody ever heard of Yasuke? Oh, wow. I'm in trouble. Everybody knows him already. <laughs> no, this is great. Um, Yasuke, let's get it started. Oh, okay. So now we're going to talk about Yasuke, real black hero, um, and how he has influenced Japanese culture. And we're going to head into, um, we're really going to discuss how really Western culture has been influenced by Japan and then how Japanese culture is influenced by Western culture. So Yasuke, um, many people believe he was a native of, oh, can you guys hear me? He was a native of uh, somewhere in Central or Western Africa. What's interesting about his origin is it's kind of mysterious because uh, uh, just the way records were kept in Japan, they are they're really good, but uh, we they they were able to trace them down to from Africa, generally Mozambique. Uh, he's believed to have been born in 1555. Um, there was a Jesuit priest, an Italian Jesuit priest, his name was Alessandro Valenguenero, and during that time, uh, Yasuke basically was basically stolen as a slave and brought uh, uh, to the Jesuit priest who basically uh, they brought, yeah, they brought him up or used him as a low paying wage. <laughs> Labor. Yeah, pretty much. And you can see here, this is him and then this is him basically serving the, um, these are some of the Japanese uh, paintings that they, I know in certain museums that they have for that. Sorry for moving over guys, it started late. <laughs> All right. One of some of the interesting things about Yasuke, he stood taller than any regular Japanese man. Uh, he was around six foot two. He was gorgeous. Said to have skin like an ox and resembled charcoal. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about him is that the, he would attract crowds of people around him. Uh, Nobunaga took an interest in him. Everybody know, heard of the warlord Oda Nobunaga? Uh, Oda Nobunaga? Okay. And um, I remember, uh, this is a great story from my instructor. Uh, I remember they took him, stripped his clothes, and tried to clean him, like scrub him dry. They thought, hey, this is trouble, we gotta get this stuff off him. And, like, what's under here is his white skin, you know, his white hands white, we gotta scrub his skin. And so they thought it was black ink, and they realized, oh no, this is his skin. <laughs> like, this is something we haven't seen before. Um, but these records that they found were in, um, the 1582 annual reports of the Jesuit missions in Japan. And this is like uh, things that you can find online and you can also find them in uh, archives in Japan. And here we have here, we have, uh, you can see this is kind of like the picture we showed before. This is kind of the completed picture. We have the slave ship or the ship that he was brought on during the missionary mission that was, uh, that he was tasked on uh, with, uh, with uh, the Jesuit priest, Villanago. Right there, the guy in the, you guys see the umbrella? That's Yasuke holding the umbrella for him. Now, Nobunaga really adored Yasuke, especially just because of his strength and stature. And within a year, he trained him to uh, learn Japanese and basically raised him from, you know, to be uh, uh, one of his feudal bodyguards. Um, he had a, um, he just had an adoring love for him just because of his stature, because of his strength, and because of just uh, his, his sense of loyalty to that, that he had to him. Um, he, we don't know what his original name was. The name Yasuke was given to him uh, by Nobunaga. And uh, through his Japanization and through all of the things that he learned through Nobunaga, uh, that's how he became one of the only, if everyone knows who the Gaijin is, pretty much an outsider. It was very, very rare at that time to see a gaijin or someone outside come uh, get that level of stature for uh, a samurai. And yeah, 
So that's a, a, a artist rendering of uh, Nobunaga there. That's a nature, but he treated him like his son, pretty much. It's kind of really fantastic. Yeah, he learned how to speak fluent Japanese at that point, and then also earned a low wage as a samurai. Mm -hmm. So that's unusual. Very unusual. And then these are some of the bronze statues that are in various uh, museums in Japan. Now this is interesting too, this is a book here, a children's book about Yasuke. It's no longer in print, but it came out in 1963. And um, basically it just kind of tells like little folk tales of Yasuke and some of his adventures. Uh, because we kind of really don't know what happened to him at the end. His ending is kind of left a little ambiguous. And um, this is a book that's, like I said, it's very, very, very rare to find. And this is kind of like the only image of, of the book that we've been able to find. And Yasuke has been portrayed, anyone play the game Neo for PlayStation 4? We've got a couple, okay, Neo. Um, I know they're working on a second one right now. But one of the important things that I, yeah. <laughs> one of the important things I wanted to, uh, to focus on with this is, if you notice, what is the release date of this game? This game came out the 7th of February here in the States and two days later in Japan. And it's only now that people are starting to really learn about him and uh, he's been getting crossed over into a lot of media. Um, as you can see here, he's portrayed as he's known as the Dark Samurai in the game. He's a tough boss to beat. Um, there's many videos on him online of showing people trying to defeat him. It's really difficult. And this is kind of like one of the screenshots here of, uh, I forget what the main character's name is in the game. Uh, the white character who plays the main character, but. <laughs> And this is another version of him in the game. But you can see here that uh, it, it's, what I'm appreciating about video games now and about the media that we're into now is that you're starting to see black heroes becoming portrayed more realistically and not stereotyped. And he was also, everyone know Afro Samurai? Yeah, yeah let's give it up for Afro Samurai. He was definitely an influence of Afro Samurai and, um, Basically, a majority of uh, what we talk about with color, color uh, Vancouver fashion. So, for those, that, did anybody come to our lecture about two years ago? Yeah, and back in 2015, we did. 15, we did a lecture on Kuru fashion, and basically, you know, the black image in Japanese anime. Um, and so, um, when we talked about uh, that image, we talked about this progression as we get into the 90s and the 2000s. Um, really talking about um, the influence that um, Western um, black fashion, music, etc., is going to have on some of our animators, our Japanese animators, to kind of get the figure, the, the black figure, to try to get the figure right, <laughs> um, is what we had talked about. So when we um, are looking at um, Japanese anime and looking at heroes, Etc. Um, a lot of our animators do admit that they look at some of the Western um, anime and Western comics to kind of see what our, the heroes look like. And when we look at Western, and I mean like UK and definitely um, American, African American, um, the discriminatory practice that we'll see or the racism that we see in a lot of the comics, it doesn't change when we go into the US. If we look at comics, especially before the um, 70s and 80s, uh, pretty much the 70s and 80s. 70s and 80s. But um, I will tell you, because we're going to talk about some Western superheroes, um, the first black hero that we're actually going to see in comics is actually going to be um, more sidekicks. So um, I was surprised, I had no clue that in 1934 they actually portrayed a sidekick for Mandrake the Magician. His name was Luthar. He had extra strength, he was from Africa, head of all these African nations. But he barely spoke English, they gave him a stereotypical costume, they called him Mandrake's Black Slave, they called him every derogatory thing you can think of in the book. Um, they didn't even put a proper suit on him until the 60s. Um, so this is kind of how we'll see uh, many of our um, black sort of heroes. Um, portraying it in Western culture. So that doesn't help <laughs> when other <laughs> entities are trying to portray um, uh, people of color in um, anime. Um, 
the odd thing about it is, is how illustrators, especially in America, are trying to um, put out or display black um, heroes. And one of the interesting things is they have to figure out how people will accept it. So many of you know Will Everett if you read if you read um, any of the comics. Um, but he actually came out in 1940 as part of the DC All Star Squadron. And the way they sold Will Everett was that Will Everett was a member of the 1936 Olympics. Now, if you all know, if you all know your history, you know we had 18 black athletes that defeated Hitler. So this is the way they sold <laughs> Will to be acceptable as sort of this black um, and really sidekick. Um, we really won't see another one until 1963, but it is important to note that we will start to see in the 40s and 50s some of our first black illustrators. So um, one of them, most famous, is Will Baker, who unfortunately died in 1959 um, of a heart attack at the age of 37. And actually, um, Stan Lee worked with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we all wonder what kind of characters they would have had because he died right before Atlas turned into Marvel Comics. Um, but we will see Gabe. Gabe is acceptable because, of course, he's Nick Fury, uh, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, at, at the time, and um, he's a military. Okay, so we're talking about World War II. We're talking about uh, someone who's a Marine military. In about 19, in about 1965, uh, Adele Comics decides we need a, a black hero. And they create uh, an animated series just for um, a, a, a black hero. It's a black western. <laughs> and um, they called him Lobo. It lasted about a year because society couldn't accept the fact <laughs> that we could have a black hero, and let alone a black western hero. So the funny thing is, is that um, as um, Atlas, if you, if you know the story about Stanley who almost quit and a couple of other comics who quit because they wanted to tell another story, when it uh, turned into Marvel Comics, uh, Stanley got together with Jack Kirby and they said, listen, we need to bring, I want some black characters, but I want like an actual superhero, like somebody who um, has these superpowers, can have, be a separate entity, but the better, perfect way to bring them in is to bring them into another series. And so they came up with this guy called Cole Tiger. <laughs> okay, and you can see some of the and some of these drawings are like the first drawing to the whatever the end of, uh, figure is. And uh, Jack Kirby showed him Cole Tiger, and Stanley was like, "What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> yeah. Who the heck is a Cole Tiger? And no one's gonna buy it." And da 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 da. So of course, with some reworks. Um, we finally get, in Boy. July of 1966, the Black Paint. Um, and extremely successful, um, but still a mystery. Like, we still don't know really what he's all about, but we know he like best. <laughs> How many people have seen Black Panther? Excellent. Yeah, this was something that was really important. Um, the movie obviously came out this year. We found out recently it's made another 700 million domestically here in the States. So I mean, this is a movie that's now over the billion dollar mark. It's part of the billion dollar club, and I'm really, really happy to see that black characters, especially in the right hands, with the right people, and the right money, that we can do these big budget movies and hang with the reps. But I think one of the things that surprises me is that a lot of these characters that are coming out now, we're gonna talk about this, yeah. you know, came out in the 60s and 70s, and this gets back to so um, they were on a roll, Marvel, and in 1969 they created the Falcon, which came out in Captain America. And um, you know, his name was, of course, Sam Wilson. Sam Wilson. Now, don't get me wrong, DC Comics was trying to compete too. If, they, if somebody put a black character out, DC was like, well, we got a black character, and, you know, and back and forth. And um, so. Um, by the time we hit 1970, one of their most popular series is the Teen Titans. They come up with their first person of color, which is Mal Duncan Box. But do you all remember Mal Duncan? Y'all know who Box is? Y'all know who Box is? No, you don't. Exactly. <laughs> y'all sitting here going, who the heck is that? Yeah. No, you don't. You know why? Because 
the storyline. Right, the story okay? it, it, didn't, it didn't pull off. So what ended up happening is DC said, wait a minute, we've got to find somebody. So they knew they had a black character in the Green Lantern series, and they said, that's easy. We'll take Jon Stewart. Who everyone knows is a true Green Lantern. Is the true, true Green Lantern, and we're going to make him the Green Lantern. Okay, no, so this right. is DC's first black superhero, is Jon Stewart of the Green Lanterns. All right, so as DC, remember we're in the 60s, and I, I, I want to stress that because we're, we're in the middle of a civil rights movement. And Stan Lee is creative director, and then you've got DC Comics, and they basically want to tell these stories, okay? And you've got to remember, this is also the year when X-Men is created. Yes. Um, you know what, X-Men is all about diversity, okay? Being ex acceptance, um, this Fantastic Four, et cetera. So Marvel hasn't had a black comic yet, or illustrator, and they hire um, someone around 72 by the name of Billy Graham. And what Stan Lee tells him is, look, you have free autonomy. I want you to create a comic, so an animated series featuring a black superhero, but the storyline's got to be awesome. It's got to be something that everybody's going to get into. It's got to be something believable. Before this time, your black figure has to be amazing. I always say it's the guess who's coming to dinner syndrome. Okay, so if you've ever seen that movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, here's Sidney Poitier is in love with this white girl. In order for that to sell with the public, he has to be like this doc, prominent doctor with all these accolades and all, the, all of this going on. And so by the time we hit the 70s, you know, they were looking for a more realistic figure. And so he and his team create, of course, the 1972 Luke Cage. That would be the first of, of animated series for a black character that actually sold and that went on. Everyone watching Luke Cage right now on Netflix? Remember how popular Luke Cage was when it first came out and it actually crashed? Yeah, yeah, I know it crashed because we were, <laughs> my family was going crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, interesting thing, after Luke Cage came out, they decided Black Panther's popularity was getting huge, but they needed to tell the story. So they hired Don McGregor, and what ended up happening is Don had done something called the jungle action, and he didn't like it. Basically, in the 50s, when he worked for Atlas, it was basically um, two white people going to Africa, and they save everybody from all these savages in Africa, okay? And he was like, I really don't like that. Stan Lee said, you got free autonomy. You can say, well, you can do whatever you want to do. And Don McGregor was like, really? <laughs> so he created Wakanda, this, the, the Wakanda that you know today. He also created the um, figure of Eric Killmonger. He was an amazing writer. So And also one of the best Marvel villains. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so just FYI, and that's who created that. Um, in 1973, Marvel created Blade. And at this time, I'm going to tell you right now, DC has black figures. As a matter of fact, Jack Kirby, who created, who illustrated Black Panther, goes to DC, and from 70 to like 76, he's creating um, Black Racer, Viking, Flipper Dipper. I mean, he's, you, you name the black character, he's creating them. Have you guys heard of those characters? <laughs> no, because no, they're sidekicks. <laughs> exactly. Okay, they really don't get a lot of play and that was one of the issues he was having. Has anyone watched the Blade anime? Yeah. A couple, okay. It does exist, I highly recommend you to watch it. Blade, the yeah. animation. Yeah. <laughs> Blade, the anime, Blade, the animation. Yeah. Um, this is important because um, as DC is trying to develop a, a new character, they actually hit the money on the mark um, when they hired uh, Tony Isabella and they hired a young black artist um, by the name of, oh Lord, now I forgot. Um, wait a minute, I know who it is. No, 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 Trevor. Trevor, <laughs> Trevor Von Eaton, and they create um, amazing storyline, Black Lightning. Everybody watching Black Lightning on oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, isn't it ironic? These started, I, just, I mean, I want you to think about it. These started 60s and 70s, now we're on television in 2018. 18. Okay. 
Um, DC really won't have another pivotal figure, and we'll talk about what happens in the 80s um, until we see Cyborg. Victor Stone is Cyborg, um, very touching story. So I know what you're probably going, Dad, you Holly, you've been talking about all these dead old men. What about the girl? Definitely have to include the ladies. What about the black women? Come on now. So I have a question for you, basically. Yeah, I got a question. Who the first was the first female black, female black superhero? Anybody? Storm. Storm? Okay, we got a couple of Storm. How many people say Storm? Vixen. You can shout it out if you want. It's totally in our Vixen. Almighty Axis. No, it wasn't that. So, yes, everybody thinks it's Storm. It is not. It is not Storm. Storm was created in night. As a matter of fact, Storm was created in May of 1975, okay? May of 1975. Now, is she one of the most popular of our blood? Oh, obviously, yes. And incredibly powerful, too. Yes, incredibly powerful. Um, I'll talk about who I'm dressed as. Yeah, you'll we'll see. And so, the reality is, is DC did it first. They did a series, and they decided, well, we're gonna showcase Wonder Woman's twin sister. You guys might know her as Nubia. Nubia. Yeah. Okay, we all know that Wonder Woman was made out of white clay, but Nubia is made out of black clay. How many people knew that? I was just curious. <laughs> sure, yeah. I did. Yeah, no, now a lot of people know that. Okay. I think it's something that they can explore. I don't know if they'll explore the new Wonder Woman 1984. I would hope at a certain point they will, but if they don't, now you guys know. Okay. And this is important because um, when they first meet, I think they battle, and then they realize we can't battle each other because we can't kill each other because because they're fighting over who's the real Wonder Woman <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but actually, she comes out in 1973, and then March of 1975, we see a character called Misty Knight. Okay, so she comes out in March, then Storm comes out. Now, a lot of people are like, Misty, wait a minute. Misty came out later. No, she didn't. Yeah. Okay? So, we don't have time to go through every single solitary black yeah, hero here. I'm here. Um, trying to make a point. Mm -hmm. But um, in 1977, Bumblebee, I saw somebody dressed as Bumblebee walking around with Bumblebee. She looked so cute. Um, is one of the Teen Titans. Becomes a popular Teen Titan. And then, of course, DC, um, we get into the 80s. And I want to talk about the 80s because that's a transformative time. Now, this is an age of hip hop, which becomes extremely popular. This is an age where we see a lot of our young Japanese animators um, being very interested in black culture. Um, and when we get into the 90s, and, and especially the 2000s, that culture transforms. So we see a more African Americans. Um, Black, I should say black African Americans yes. getting interested in Japanese anime, right? Which brings us all here today. And but the 80s is amazing in anime because all of a sudden on both sides we start seeing a more realistic character. Okay? Um, DC does it with Amanda Waller. She's a mom. She loses, I think she loses her child from a gang shooting or something like that. I mean, look at the okay. way she's pushing up against and that. She's bad. Yeah, she's okay. We all know. What does she create? What does Amanda Waller create? Oh, the Suicide Squad. Okay, y'all remember the movie. Did you guys like the movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <you did. laughs> I know, DC really needs to get the butts together, but you know. Hopefully they'll be. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Amanda Waller's good. Amanda Waller's good. But all of a sudden, um, another thing that's happening is there's a realization that a lot of people don't understand some of the previous black characters, so they bring some of them back. So we'll see, for example, will Everett will come back in the Justice League, okay? And they'll play up that. We'll see characters that kind of look like other characters. So for example, we'll see John Henry Irons as Steel. Did anyone okay. see the movie Steel? The Shack? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, by the time we hit the 90s and 2000, of course, we'll have um, figures that um, all of a sudden now here is their black side of the figure. So, for example, we'll have Miles Morales, the Spider Man, which everybody, we're all hoping that. It's going to be in the news. Yes, uh, the PS4 game with the yes. Spider-Man, and um, also what is it, the Spider-Man, or Spider-Man, the Spider-Verse movie that's coming out, coming out this December. 
And then my favorite, I love her. Um, she just came out. Yes. Um, is Riri Williams, who's the new Iron Girl. Is coming out. And then, does anybody know who I'm dressed as? Let's take one quick guess. The I bet you know what I'm dressed as. I'm dressed as. I am dressed as. What did you say? No, I'm not Storm. Not Storm. I, am, I am dressed as the daughter of Storm and Black Panther. Yeah. Chimera. Isn't this kind of like oh, the Mercer? You are not. <laughs> I mean, it's all these reviews. So this is what happens in 2000s. They start taking the relationships. So you all know that Storm and Black Panther had a relationship. They were married for two years. So someone has written a, a, a series that deals with their daughter, Chimera, who can talk to animals. She can telepathically talk to animals. That's what her power is. Okay? So we're starting to see these new superheroes emerge. At the same time, in Japan, we're starting to see African Samurai. African Samurai. Everyone familiar with Samurai Champloo? Yeah. <laughs> we're starting to see the influence. See, I knew everyone was kind of like, when you're talking about a lot of these Western characters, but how does it go back to Yasuke? How does it go back to uh, Japanese culture? Now you're starting to see that. It'll come all around. And um, my favorite, I'll be honest with you, in 2009 is Blue Marble. Do y'all know Kevin Grubo? Okay, you need to look him up. Kevin Grubo, G-R-E-V-I-O-U-X. Ex-football player, bio, he's a geneticist, master's in genetics. In 2009, he created Blue Marvel. He's done Underworld. If you guys look at his resume, he's done, I don't know, like every freaking superhero. <laughs> he's done a lot. He's done a lot right now. But I love Blue Marvel because he tells the story from starting in the 60s and to the present. In the 60s, he is the only, only superhero that can defeat anybody who's a part of the Avengers. Blue Marvel. He is the only one. He wears a mask. When they find out, when the government finds out he's black, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, asked him to please hide his identity because he didn't think society could um, accept the fact that a black man was this big of a superhero. He goes into hiding, they think he's dead. Tony Stark takes over the Avengers and finds out that there was somebody called the Blue Marvel. Does his research finds out he's alive, <laughs> and the rest is history. It's a, it's well written, um, it's a great series to look up. Um, and I say this because this is what we're starting to see and what I'm hoping for those of us who are in love with Japanese anime. We're hoping to see more of these figures, these heroes, besides, you know, last last time I was sitting here, I was dressed as... Um, oh my God, uh, <laughs> Jackson from yeah, Hitchfield Jackson. Yes. <laughs> with my fro, my blonde fro, and, yeah. my, and my trench coat on. I highly encourage everyone yeah, to yes. go on YouTube right now, type in Kuro Fashion uh, Studio Americana, or Kuro Fashion Otakon 2015, and you'll definitely see how all the pieces and everything fall into place, uh, because pretty much, I mean, we pretty much discussed how fashion, how black culture, and Japanese culture have all mixed, and it's only until now that we're starting to see this bubbling and rise. That's why I'm so proud today to see so many diverse, diverse people, people coming into yes. this industry. I mean, I'm just really liking the way that- I mean, how many years have you been coming here now? Like, this is 13. <laughs> so, I mean, I remember- I mean, He's in his 30s and yeah, I'll be 50 30s. soon. Yeah. So, I'm just telling you, um, you know, we go, we go to these and all of a sudden I'm like, wow. Wow, we see okay. a lot. And it's just so great, like I see everyone's cosplay, I see all these different, I just, all these different diversities, I mean, it's, Yuri here, just in case you just have to know, Yuri is uh, my, uh, Yuri's a pilot, she's a certified flight instructor, and she's also my flight instructor. <laughs> uh, I'm also a pilot as well. Um, I just finished uh, getting my, uh, her, 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 student pilot. <laughs> but uh, I just, uh, last week, just finished taking my FA knowledge test, passed with flying colors, and I'm going to so what I'm hoping is um, the only way you can push for, um, you know, we've been pushing and I remember hoping and praying. I was like, oh, please, I don't want any more stereotypical characters. Yes. Um, and un unfortunately, a lot of times in Japanese anime, it goes back and forth. 
Um, you know, I, we, I had sit, I didn't see the Sambo dolls for a while, I remember? Oh, and then I went to Japan last year, and I was like, oh, there they are again. And so, <laughs> um, but um, I will say I'm proud to say when somebody looks at a character and has to figure out what color they are, is they're black, and the animators go, like, they've got dreads. Of right. course they're black. <laughs> um, that's kind of a good thing. <laughs> and one of the things that just in like talk with Holly is saying, I know it's, it's almost like these reveals that people are kind of getting, because it was kind of interesting to see you guys' reaction when we were mentioning some of these things. People are like, oh, yeah, I've heard you ask it, but he's not really in the mainstream or anything like that. And, his history is almost, in a way, kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie, which we do know that Lionsgate is working on a live-action uh, Yasuke movie. Um, have I had anything that? Oh, reveal number ten. <laughs> 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 today. No, this is great. So um, we're starting to really see that. Um, I think they're really trying to make this Yasuke movie like the next Hunger Games. I really hope it becomes a really successful, popular series, as we're starting to see with a lot of these other uh, black characters. Mm -hmm. And you know, our, our, we always say, please fight for the characters in our Japanese anime to be, you know, acceptable. Yes. <laughs> and please fight for our, our, you know, for heroes who look like us to, to be out there. Of um, all kinds. Because I can tell you right now, um, we buy anime like, it, like crazy. We do. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, we love it. And, um, it's, but it's awesome to see more um, African Americans into Japanese anime. I'm so super excited. We need to demand that from some of these industries over here too, guys. And, and not just black culture. Again, we don't want to really, we want to enforce the black culture, but we want to enforce a whole yeah. set of people. Yeah, Has anybody yeah. seen Nishiko yeah. Dalacha? Inclusion, people yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. So. Yes, definitely. All right. All right, any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah. Can you, can you yeah, everyone just like to question from the mic, yes. Alright. Don't be shy. Oh, don't be shy. She's like, oh, hi. No, I don't know how to do that. You look great about it. Yeah. So my question was going back to what she just said, actually. Do you feel that as black people were entitled to have representation in anime, or is it just kind of a You mean do I think we should have in title? So I'm in a black anime group on Facebook and this question came up and I really want your face. Interesting. We're not, so it is Japanese I mean, culture is, does not we're not represented in Japanese culture at all. Except because we're not there. We're not we're not there. So do you feel that because the world is becoming more diverse, because we're getting more of these not as in popular culture, should Japanese animators start incorporating us? And I think that's the reason why Japanese animes, animators incorporate exactly. more. Exactly. I mean, you see because, uh, because of this diversity and this, um, I always call it cultural assimilation. We mm -hmm. get, okay, there's no, there's no if, ands, or buts. You're, you're sitting here assimilating a Japanese, <laughs> part of the Japanese culture. And they, trust me, okay, I mean, I've got friends in Japan with froze and braids and everything else. They assimilate our culture. So, like, when Holly is, uh, Holly's also, Holly goes to, uh, is, is a VCU professor and you want to tell them what they did? Oh, yeah, so I'm a, a associate professor, actually in the Department of Fashion Design and Merchandising at VCU. Um, but I'm also Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity. So um, I'm into anime. <laughs> I'm and she's been to Japan many times. I've been to Japan a lot. Um, and so um, the beauty of their culture is that they will assimilate the culture and then look at me and say, girl, I love your black style. Okay? At least they know they're wearing my black style. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always An acknowledgement of that, um, which is, you know, really nice to hear, but um, there, I mean, we're in worlds where we're assimilating each other's culture, and if we're assimilating these, each other's culture, I mean, if you've ever been to Takashiki Dori down the street, you go down to the end, you go to Black Annie, you go to all of these places, I mean, you go to Black Annie, you're going to find shirts from Good Time, yeah. Sam for the Sun, I mean, they assimilate the culture, so it's not us, it's a, it's a situation where if you're going to assimilate our culture, then you put our culture in the... Exactly. The anime, just it's the same thing for us. We should put their culture and our and our comic books. And what I also like about, like, the next time, like, the, what I've always liked about coming to cons and stuff like that, have you got, uh, one of the things I like that is not creepy, it's just, when you look at how people dress, just in regular clothing, you're just, you're just like, wait, oh, 
that Joyce album? It's just really interesting to see that. I mean, I'm just hoping that one day we, we're not to a point like, you know, we were talking about that, like, Black Panther. Well, yeah. Why does it have to be the Black Panther? Why can't it just be the Panther? Yeah. And, I mean, and don't get me wrong, we were in a, you know, when you're in a pro-black movement, you want the Black Panther, we need the Black Panther right now. But I'm just saying that, um, you know, everybody wants this Kumbaya society where we're not really thinking about color. And, and I think that this is really interesting. We, we were bringing this up in a really interesting time that we're in, especially with, unfortunately, the things that are unfortunately going to happen tomorrow. I just think that the timing of this was kind of, we were going to do this panel last year, but just things came up, you know, I started flying. And, um, you know, I had martial arts tournaments to do. Oh, speaking of too, I, uh, on April 22nd, also won my very first martial arts tournament in first place. <laughs> but, I'm sorry, questions, yes. <laughs> You know, because you try to find people that look like you. And I thought, oh, you know, this black animator did this and this black animator did that. And the majority of our black superheroes, except for maybe Luke okay. Cage, a couple, you know, and, and ones that are in comic books where that are black owned, okay, are white illustrators. And so I do give kudos to someone who's trying to put out um, and trying to tell our tell the story. Um, in a way, and but I'm, yeah, I could, we couldn't talk about every. Trust me, it would take us five hours to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And if you heard of Neil Adams, and if you guys listen to, I love Kevin Smith, the director. Um, I listen to his podcast, uh, Batman on Batman, episode fifty-five at the fifty-seven thirty-four second mark. Oh yeah, I listen to it all the time. He talks about that a lot, yeah. about how a lot of uh, white illustrators want to bring black heroes into. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. Um, bringing it back to anime, especially after what we just said about like doing are we right to ask for representation in anime? I'm also wonder I'm wondering on the flip side, what do you think happened from the early two thousands to the nineties when we kind of stopped getting any sort of influence from the black community in anime? Because we think about the late 90s and 2000s, we had Samurai Shampoo, right. uh, Afro Samurai, uh, even Boondocks comes out on the Boondocks side. Right. Uh, and then even in, I think, like, like 05 or 06, we have Project K, mm -hmm. which also, like, the soundtrack is bomb because it's usually really, really heavy in the um, mm -hmm. center. And that was something we lost. It. Like, I can't tell you any other sort of, like. So, your first question was the. What was the first question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, first question. Mm -hmm. Why did they pull back? Maps, right? And I hate it, and, 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 you know, people can't stand when I say something is a trend or something is a fad or whatever. Um, so, for example, um, I do a lot on um, Japanese fashion, and, you know, Gangnam girls were really popular. They were the ones coloring their skin really dark and black, and, and you know, they're not anymore now. A lot of them have had to, to, to change. Um, and. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, when, the, when society or hip-hop is in, or this is in, or that is in, uh, all of a sudden it's popular. Right. Um, when it's not popular to them anymore, and I mean, they know what's going on. It's like Nicki Minaj is coming over here for Japanese anime. I mean, they're like, okay, well, we don't have to assimilate their assimilate. Right. <laughs> and you got to think about that. And it goes both ways all the time. So, um, sometimes that happens. Um, but yeah, why stop? And that's my problem. I'm, 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 just, I'm just being real. Yeah. Like, why, yeah, like, all of a sudden, you have these amazing characters, like, why did you stop? Good question. Good question, yeah. <laughs> and we all do remember that, um, and before you get to that, uh, Blade was the one who really, Blade in 1998, started pretty much the, the, the comic book, live action heroes that we know today, pretty much. Thank you, everyone, that's that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if it's so much a question, I guess kind of will be a question eventually. I'm going to see if you guys agree. So take it back off what you were saying earlier. Absolutely. I, I don't necessarily think we 
we have some sort of entitlement. I think maybe certain industries. For example, we take a look, we see like DBZ, right? DBZ is the main culprit of this. Like, this is plenty of like degrading examples as far as the black people in DBZ. Like, Mr. Popo is just flagrant. You know what I mean? Her cue being actually Mr. Satan. Uh, his daughter, Adele, being, you know, the devil and things like that. Like, so much to the point where we basically had to adopt Piccolo, like, if Piccolo's the black person, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> someone, and, th and this happens ever so often, you're going to portray someone of color, okay, in a way that's not appropriate or not what, as a person of color, what we are. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I guess before I walk off, it's just not to say that people, like, because you brought up Chantu, like, Chantu is a good example, like, Chantu was literally with a bunch of pop culture, and yes. wasn't shy about it, and did it just for some of them, so I just think it would be a good deny, especially since for certain people, because DBZ is a global juggernaut. I don't feel like the other like kind of seemed to lead up for that because it was just fleeting, it was just right. their disrespect, and they just kept it moving. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Oh, we got nothing. Hey. Great. Hey guys. Thank you, that was a great question, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and in that, I wanted to also uh, kind of uh, just acknowledge something else that uh, we will kind of reveal. Um, I wanted to also tell you that uh, first I wanted to give special thanks to my, uh, my instructors, uh, Masters Pamela Justice and uh, Master Chuck Thorpe. They were the ones who, through my training, had taught me about, told me who Yasuke was, and I said, I literally sat at their foot, so and it was just like, it was great, it was like campfire stories, listening to who he was, listening to what he had to go through, and I know, like I said, pretty much how we met. I mean, um, Holly does martial arts as well, but the same person, and um, it's, it's, Something like I said, I want to see, like you said, that representation. And Yuri here introduced me um, not too long ago to um, a female artist uh, going by the uh, handle of uh, Ari Dynamics. I want to give a special props to her. Her and I together a few weeks, or actually about several weeks ago, are starting to, and if you see her artwork, it's amazing. Uh, we decided, okay, instead of just talking about it, let's do it. We decided to start working on a Yasuke manga. So we want to do that. And um, eventually, too, I'd like to also do a Yasuke web series as well, online series. We've got the technology now. Things are so easy to do now. We have easier access and the barrier of entry is just right there. The technology is good. I think that we could really make something that I would also like to premiere at Otakon. conclude with this. We want more diversity in our, in our in our anime, whether it's Western or Japanese anime, okay? And the reason why is because um, it's very influential, okay? If, you know, I, I learned how to read because one of my teachers gave me a comic book, right. you know? Um, I, 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 my son stuttered and that's how I got him into Japanese anime. <laughs> um, is by him reading and him reading Yeah, good Japanese good. subtitles basically subtitles. When, I was, when I was growing up subtitles and uh, Akira was my first one, my first yeah. anime. The heroes was, uh, are influential right. to young kids, to young people um, who they can identify with. And that's, you know, I think that's important and I think that's what makes um, animation special. Yeah. Did everybody enjoy themselves so far? I know we had a little technical issues, but I know we had a I'm going to go to TV time for the time. Uh, yeah, so right now, did everyone get a raffle ticket? Everyone got them? Okay, so you're here. It's going to reach in. You want to put it in the back? Yeah, oh, go ahead. We've got uh, another five minutes. Oh, five minutes, yeah. Okay. Yes. I just want to get your opinion. Yes. On the underhanded racism in Black Lightning. Like, how do you feel on it? Like, do you see it? Um, because the protagonist is a, uh, I don't remember what they're called, uh -huh. but he's black, but he's light-skinned. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's like, he hates black people. Like, his whole thing is like, he hates black people. I actually like the representation of certain, some types of black people, though. <laughs> Unfortunately. As far as unhindered racism? Um, and it's all from my white person. At the end of the day, the one white, um, the one person that helped like like he got tired of it. He was like, oh, I'm tired of kidnapping black people. Well, uh, and, and I'm gonna hold out now. And this is another thing I always say, if you love what you do, just like he said, he's getting ready to walk. You know, he's, he's not gonna talk about it anymore, he's gonna walk the walk. So he's going to try to write something and he's going to try to create something so that you won't, you won't see those in our characters. Right. I mean, I just showed you, the majority of our heroes were made, were illustrated and written by white artists or <laughs> white right. illustrators. They tell the stories. Some of those stories have been fabulous and some of those stories have not been fabulous. So, you know, how do we change that? Um, we have to stand up know, and do it. You know, that's and I think I, we've got so many, I think I've been an artist out there, so many artists out there. You have out there who is so into it, I'm like, that's what you're going to major in. Exactly. I mean, that's what you need to major in. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and do the I don't know if I answered your question, but... Yeah. Not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, so Yuri's got a number. 15? Yeah. Oh, wow. You get some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and it happens to be Komodo Dragon, one of my favorite. Okay. Another one? 42. <laughs> That's you? 42, give it up. All right. One up. There is one in here. Uh, 